Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode number 372 of the podcast. Today, we have my friend Aisha Ophelia with us. And actually, this is really fun because I had a little pause there because in the beginning of the interview, I said her name wrong and she fixed me. And so I was just having a moment being like, oh my God, did I say it wrong again? But I'm pretty sure I got it right. But when we get into the interview recording, then we'll all figure out if I said it right or not. So anyway... <laughs> Just a real human moment there for you. Aisha is somebody who I've been connected to on Instagram for so many years. Like she did my original I Shine You Shine challenge in 2014. But this year in 2021, seven years later, um, we finally got to connect more deeply. Uh, we started talking on the phone. She came to Miami. I got to meet her in real life. It was always the best to meet people in real life. I love the way Aisha expresses and embodies her artistry, her mysticism. Um, her viewpoints on things and how she shares. Um, this is a person, she's a Scorpio. And one of the things I love about a lot of Scorpios is how they will go into the depths. They will go to the highest highs and the lowest lows and talk about the shadow and talk about the light, and everything in between. And that's exactly what we did in this episode today. So I hope you love this. I hope you follow her on Instagram. Her Instagram is one of my favorites to follow. I love watching her stories. Anything we mentioned in the show can be found at untameyourself.com forward slash 372. And as always, share this up, listen more than once, use it as a conversation piece with your friends and family or whoever it is that you like to geek out on embodiment or spiritual things or mystical things with, healing and growth oriented things. And that's it. Let's get into the show. Aisha, you are here. Wait, hold on. You said my name wrong. <laughs> I was just going to, the next thing I was going to say was, did I say it right? So please correct me. And we're not even unrecord like this will be in it because this is part of life needing to learn yeah. how to say people's names right okay so it's not Aisha it's not Aisha fix it's me Aisha Aisha yeah I got it now thank you I yeah. only said it yeah. I knew for, for I think when we met when you were here in Miami recently I was like I'm pretty sure in my brain I've been saying your name wrong for seven years mm -hmm. yeah. and then you corrected it but I still said the a wrong Aisha Aisha yeah I got it now I love it. Um, and Ophelia, is that your last name or is that your middle name? That is my last name. It's actually my mother's given middle name. And when she passed away about seven years ago, I felt very unanchored. It was a strange feeling. I just knew I wasn't a Meriwether, but I knew I wasn't going to like give myself a spiritual name. So I just kind of waited Mm. And I had, and I hadn't even changed my name when I was married. Okay. And so I had this dream and in it, my mom said, Asia Ophelia. And mm. I woke up the next day and I went down to the courthouse and I stood in front of the judge and I received my new name, but given name. And the rest of my life has been, it changed. It really does. There's a lot of power in the name. I love that story. And I skipped over the first question that I always ask everyone this, this season of the podcast. And when I say season, like we're not like recording a season. I just mean like however long this season yeah. lasts. Got it. The season of, of our your lives. Life. Yes. yes. <laughs> um, how's your heart today? Ooh. Um, let me, let me um you know, it's like quiet. It's like quiet and expanded and um open. Yeah. I love that. And you know what I also love that we rescheduled this. We would have been recording during Libra season, but now it's Scorpio season. It's your season. That's right. I wish this was a Scorpio now that I'm like, Ooh, I got into like making my own bolos last year and uh -huh. I'm find a Scorpio. That's a good Ooh. idea. So yeah. for people who are listening, not watching, it looks like a leopard or a jaguar or a panther. Yeah. I think it's a jaguar. It was just something fun. I found at the craft store when I was in like, I, I can make bolos. I want to wear bolos. So I made a couple and now <laughs> I think it would be really fun to have a scorpion. Okay. So this is one of my favorite things about you. We've been connected online for so long. You are so creative. Where does all the creativity come from? I don't know, but I thought that's where, 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 what we were going to talk about. And this morning, I had actually picked a card yesterday that says creativity comes from uncertainty. Oh. And I was thinking about that. And I was like, actually, that's kind of one of my least favorite things, even though, you know, Scorpios are like mysterious. We're in the mystery. But it's really the only thing I've ever been good at. It's it's effortless, like breathing. And I want people to remember their creativity. It doesn't have to express like mine does. But I think we're all innately creative to me because we're all the essence of 
um, something that's bigger than ourselves. Yeah. And our, our cells create and we don't have anything to do with it. And that's the ultimate creative act to me. And so I know that we are an extension of it. And I think it, it can look at all different types of ways. But yeah, that's a, that's a big part of my, my mission. How would you describe your creativity or your creative process or your creative flow? I love asking people this question and I'm with you. I believe everyone is creative. I love asking people this because there really are people who have themselves convinced that they're not creative for whatever reason, but hearing about other people's creativity, they might be like, oh, I actually do that. Or I love that. Or that's great. Or I would enjoy that. And maybe something might spark or seed might get planted for someone. Well, for me, because it's like my second language, it's innate, but I think a lot of people have to reacquaint themselves with what their creativity looks like. And so for me, my process is just getting open and receptive and seeing what's around me that's inspiring me. And I mean, you can see, I have a lot of colors. I have a lot of textures. I have a lot of things that really like ignite that spark within me. Mm-hmm. I actually used to have a blog called The Spark Seeker that ignite that spark within me. But I think that it's a thing that we can all remember. And if we scan our lives, we can find something, some thread of creativity, something that we do that makes life our own, if that makes sense. So I don't, you know, I don't, it depends on what I'm working out, what my creative process looks like, but I really just get into an open creative state. And when I'm not feeling like that, there's certain things that I do just to like jar myself back into um, what I feel is a natural state for myself. I love that. Okay. So one form of creativity of yours that I see all the time is like your Instagram stories. So I'm curious is that part of like, even like all the techie little things, I always mean to like message you and be like, what apps do you even use to like lay this picture over that and put a video yeah. in here and all these filters? And We don't need to get into that here, but I'm curious in terms of the process is even like finding the little techie things to use part of the creative process. Is that agitating? Because for me, that stuff is agitating. No. I was thinking about what my new titles are because every season I get like, I'm a coach, I'm a writer. Those things are just staying the same, but I'm like, you're a curator. So I've always been a curator of a lot of things, which has been, um, I'm kind of glad that they're a lot digitally now, even though my phone's always like the, like the, the, um, I'm always full on my phone. I have to get rid of stuff. But when I was a kid, I collected magazines religiously. I made collages religiously. I just think Mm -hmm. I had this very like devoted, almost like obsessive personality with certain things. And that has translated over into my creative process online. I just always thought I'd have a network or like a radio station or a broadcast system and something about Instagram, especially when they got stories, it like, it was like the perfect creative challenge for me because I I have so much imagery and have a real knack for music. Like it just never leaves my mind. If if I've heard a song. You're so good at that. You're so good at putting the songs on the things. I'm always like, yes. She, yeah. yeah. I always put my sound on for your stories. <laughs> Thank you. That's what I really freaking love to hear. So to me, it's like a, 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 the tension is good. It's not like if it's overwhelming, I honestly take a break and just, yeah, yeah. just to like um, give a disclaimer, which I hardly ever do. I'm unmarried. I'm single. I don't have kids. I have a lot of time and I have a lot of like sexual energy. And to me, sexual mm-hmm. energy is creative energy. Yeah. So in order to not be a hoe, I create a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> that That's the quote that's going on the podcast page this week. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. And so in order to not be a hoe, I create a lot of things. Yeah, Honestly, yeah. probably me too. Yeah, exactly. It's the creative energy and I really love to channel it into certain things and, you know, Instagram has become increasingly weird with censorship and things like that but I still love using it as a means to like, just like a stream of consciousness and a means to share what's going on with me and see how it resonates with other people. And that's how I've built my whole audience. I've never like done a contest or asked for people to come to the page, honestly, just to like poured, like completely poured myself into that and my work over the course of the last seven years. Well, and that's, what's cool. Like that's shareable. That's magnetic. Like you're just being yourself. I do, I mean, I do enjoy a bit of like marketing and things and like kind of getting, figuring out on like, what's the word I'm looking for? Like non-coercive, non-douchey ways to like get people to like take some actions. Cause I have that innate, like 
teacher in me, like, come on, y'all have a realization, have a revelation, do something. You got this, but in your way, not my way. Um, So I love that about you. I was thinking about this morning, probably because you were going to be my interview today. Someone recently called me a, like a curator. She's like, I love how you curate stuff in your stories. And I'm like, I don't curate things. I'm like, I just share what I like. And she's like, that's curation. (laughs) I was like, oh. (laughs) I mean, it is in the simplest form it is. And I mean, you're, I've seen bits and pieces of your house from your stories and even the way you've curated your books and sort of like, they're like color coded, like that's a form of curation. Mine definitely aren't, but there it's still a curation it's a collection it's things that I love and it's it's yeah and somehow there really is like this poetic and appropriate way that things end up going together Mm -hmm. and flowing into each other and when you introduce something new it's like oh yeah of course she does that because this is also what I love about you because your creativity is so vast and, and, and I love this because, and I'm, I'm one of those people, you probably have this in your stories all the time of people being like, what book is this? Yeah. By the way, for every once I send that to you, there's 10 times I'm not. <laughs> Cause I'm like, I do not need to be bugging this person every day to be like, what are you reading, bitch? But, um, I always want to know what you're reading. You read so much. I read so much. I love that. And I love snippets. Because for me, and so I'm going to be curious, this is going to be the question for you. I rarely finish books anymore. Yeah. I, it's like, I'm constantly dancing, picking this one up, putting that one down. And it is, it's like a passage here and there is like all I need to get sent off on some mystical, intellectual, spiritual adventure of the day. Yeah. Realization, whatever. We're the same. The last book I read was The Shamanic Way of the Bee. And I'm actually reading this Anastasia. Have you heard about this series? It's like nine books written by this. I'm probably going to butcher some of the details, but you'll get the essence of it. It's a series of nine books written originally in Russian, translated to English about, it's supposed to be real life about this woman who lived within this cedar ring. And so it's extremely magical. There's a lot of power within trees and nature. And she just lived in a totally different way and had all these powers and abilities and whether or not you believe it's real or it's fantasy, it's an escape. It's like, it's spiritual, it's mystical. And Mm -hmm. um, I know I'm going to read it all because they're really easy reads. I'm like almost done with the first book and I can't wait to read more. I feel like it's like the feminine version of Dune. I've never seen Dune or read Dune, but I know dudes love Dune. It's supposed to be this like other world and, you know, like these warrior principles, like Star Wars. Probably. I don't know. I didn't really watch that either, but it feels like the feminine version of that so far. Anastasia. Yeah. So someone was asking me this recently. I think it came up in a healing session or an Akashic Records reading. Um, Or maybe it was Q&A, whatever. I'm on 30,000 calls every week of my life. But um, yeah, fiction, I can read. It was a coaching call. I remember now. Um, Fiction, I can pour through. When I say I don't finish books anymore, I mean like, spiritual or self-help or anything like instructional. Yeah. Um, Except Carolyn Mace. I've been binging her stuff lately, but I've been listening more than anything. Um, But the fiction, I really got into, I really got back into fiction during the pandemic. So I was like, I need stories. Yeah. I need, I don't want to be like watching Netflix all the time. I'm not knocking TV. I love TV, but I was like, I need this. I need my brain engaged. I felt like my attention span waning yeah. in a way that I wasn't okay with. So I'm like, but I need something like beautiful, like gripping, compelling, not just some like something that's designed to like make you want to like turn the pages because drama. Yeah. Um. So I love that. I will check out that series. Thank you. So what happens for you when you read? Well, speaking of storytelling, I think that's an important little tangent we can go on for a minute because when I was thinking about the things that really would create the new earth, it's like community and it's really simple and we can like, that's really locking in more for me what that means. Mm. Um, Secondly, it's storytelling because I think we've all been had the finger pointed at us and told this is what you're supposed to do and this is how you do it. But from the beginning of time, the way that we learned was actually through storytelling, Mm. obviously experience too, but storytelling myth and creativity and community like that I think is revolutionary and it's way more simple than we think and 
there's a term that um, is an African term and it's called griot. And my dad was like, you're the griot of the family. And I didn't, I love words. I love finding out what new words mean. And that, that word is the storyteller, the one who carries the stories, the one mm-hmm. who has all the family photos. You know, my mom's passed away, but I say her name the most. I bring her into conversation. And so mm-hmm. this, this, that feels like my role. My stories feel like storytelling. You know, sometimes I, it can be pointed like, but usually I like for people to have something within them raised, whatever that is. Yeah. Um, and then they get to answer that question for themselves. Something unlocks in them, something opens up. It's an invitation. It's not like this, this is the way. It's like, what is the way for you? And I think that storytelling really can get us out of our literal minds, back into our bodies. Oh, my, the last title that I've given myself is soul revivalist because I love that. I've been working with people a lot, clients a lot. And, you know, sometimes we're, it's, it gets to be very practical and we're talking about things sort of on a surface level and Scorpios love to go deep. And when we go deep, we found, we find that the, the, the way that the soul wants to meander is a lot different than what we think we're supposed to be up to, but that something really beautiful is happening if we're willing to look at it from the soul level. And so you know, I think we're a nation of soul sick people. And so it feels like a honor to like help people remember that there's this eternal part of themselves that's unchanged, that is wise, Mm -hmm. um, that they can interact and speak to and connect with. Hallelujah. Um, Okay. Storytelling for a second. I had an experience. It was last year, actually. I started working with this 81 year old shaman and best and honestly, most of our sessions, she would just talk yeah. and tell me stories. And I remember being irritated for the first one being like, I need help. And this bitch talked like the <laughs> whole time, right? <laughs> what the hell's going on? <laughs> What's going on? But then I went to sleep that night and I had dreams. And then I was like thinking, like there were things in her stories that like stuck with me that were like bothersome, but like bothersome in a good way in ways that I needed to be bothered so I can have realizations or so I could just be like, why is this bothering me so much? And then be like, oh, and I really, through the experience of listening to her stories, um, a couple of things happen. I've always been a storyteller as well, but there's this, there's so many distortions and perversions in like the overarching like self-help industry. And I think one of the things that gets so weird for people is the, the murky, weird, funky ways that people create narratives around being self-centered, right. Or sharing your own experience um, as if your own lived experience is only valuable for certain people or, you know, whatever. And what felt so validating about working with Maria Elena and listening to her stories and realizing I was like, I, I can't help myself. I always share personal experiences, not from a place of being like, if I could do it, you could do it. Cause we're all so different, mm-hmm. but exactly what you said to be like, I'm going to tell you a story and I want you to listen, not even for the details of my story, but for whatever jumps out at you and goes, hi, mm-hmm. I'm the detail you needed, or I'm the spark or I'm the whatever. And I love that you shared that as well. And I hope people here listening. I even remember years ago, someone saying, you know, if someone is is writing and you just keep seeing the word I, 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 you shouldn't be listening to them. And I'm like, okay, like, what are we, why are we out here trying to create and live these rich, impactful, meaningful lives? Yeah. If we're not going to frigging tell people what's happening. Mm. It's true. As a person who writes a lot, I, I use we a lot. Mm-hmm. And not because there isn't an I, but I really, it's like, I know when I need to say I, and I know when it's yeah. the collective we, because, you know, we have, we have all been so pitted against each other. And I feel like I chose exactly who I was going to be in this lifetime. So I could not have to hear a lot of the bullshit. You know what I mean? It's like, are you going to listen to black women? Or are you going to try to censor me right now? And so I think <laughs> talking about privilege, I, I, I kind of don't believe in it. And I know that's not um, appealing to a lot of people. It's not that it's not a real thing. It's that I've decided and my ancestors are all on board for this. We fought, we fought for you to be able to have a different kind of life. Do you want to live that? Or do you want to live by the old rules? Mm. And so when I started telling myself a new story, saying some of those mantras felt extremely disempowering. And I was like, I can't have anything to do with that. And if we're supposed to be a species who evolves out of some of our lower 
qualities, if you will, then can I model that? And especially can I use my privilege? Because we all have different, when I think about nature, I think like, if we're saying that certain things have privilege, right? And an elephant has a different privilege than a mouse. We can't really compare those two. And so coming in as the person you are, we have different privilege based on societal things. You know, I'm tall, that could be a different privilege. And so I really just want to use all of the beautiful things that I am to bring about something new, a new conversation about what it means to be a woman, about what it means to be a woman of color, about if I need your power in order to move around in this world, or if I don't you know, and, or if I choose not to, you know, whatever it is, there's a lot of societal things that, as we know now, we do not want to ascribe to any longer, and we want to move into something different. So if I can model that. Yeah, I appreciate that. I, you know, something I've been thinking about since you were here, I remember we were in the ocean, and for whatever reason, I used the word marginalized, and you were like, yeah, I don't subscribe to that. And I loved hearing your perspective on that, because recently I saw a, a woman, a um, black woman, she's a business coach and her whole branding and marketing since last year now revolves around marginalized entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And I was just hearing you um, share how you're like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not taking that label on for myself anymore. Uh, would you mind sharing your perspective on that? And again, I like what you said, listen, it might not resonate for some people and we're not out here being like, you have to think this way. Like if there's two people that I'm certain are not out here, like you need to think like us, it's me and you. <laughs> yeah, I like that. Yeah, I mean, you can keep on the chains of, of any of those things for as long as you want. And there's gonna be a lot of business around it. There's gonna be, there was a quote that I said last year, and it was that there's a lot of institutions and people that want to sell you on your collective neediness, and I'm not one of them. So I'm not one that's going to continue to ascribe to something that makes me lower and need something outside of myself. Just spiritually, that doesn't make sense for me. And I know that there's a lot of other people that are moving in that way and have seen like, okay, yes, we live in a society that pushes these people to the front, but the society is sick like, I don't want to ascribe to it. So I'm not going to, and for a while, these were ideas I've considered because everyone's considering them in the ethos. And I'm like, okay, what does that look like? What does it look like for certain people to realize that, oh my gosh, this person's had a different um, story moving through this system than I have. I think all these things are great, but if we cling, if we hold on to them too much, especially something that's disempowering, it leaves us handicapped, you know, and I just, it doesn't make sense to me. And I just, for a while, when all of it was really popular, it was like, I, I, every email I opened was like from a white woman telling me that she is going to help me and like, give me some of her privilege. And I just was like, oh, this feels like, I don't, this is not the jam, you know? <laughs> and uh, so I just had to fundamentally reject it. And it, it, it sounds like a lot of things in my childhood that I had to decide early on. All right, this is how people are acting, but this doesn't make sense for me inside. And I don't have to, just to be a part of the group, I don't have to take on this yeah. thing. And it doesn't mean that I don't, I don't experience people who still have this malware installed, they do, but I've uninstalled mine pretty much. And I feel, I fucking feel free. And I think we all should feel that way. And we should all move as such and see the ways in which our life changes, yeah. you know? Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate yeah. that. Yeah. Um, I want to come back to community. So I know you've been doing some traveling and trying out some different places and spending time in different communities. So what are you thinking about community these days? What does it mean to you? What do you want to see it mean? How do you want to have it in your life? What it means for me now is so... I was talking to a friend the other day and she told me that she knew she won when she was sick at home, she lived alone. And that uh, just by one simple text, her neighbors came over and like the next three meals were taken care of for her. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of community care that I think creates the new world. I think a lot of this, the symptoms that women have. So for instance, like postpartum, like a lot of things are affect us because we're so disjointed. We're in our little house. I'm taking care of me. You're taking care of you. Maybe I know you a little bit. You don't have to become best friends with all your neighbors, but I do think that it's this, this care of one another that removes our need for all of the trickle down care. That's not really even care that we get from a lot of the uh, 
um, you know, governmental structures around us. And so for me, it's as simple as that. But I've been dipping my toe in and out of community a long time, really trying to figure out, okay, how does this look? There's so, been so many downfalls of community. We've seen a lot of like misuse of power and maybe everyone, my idea of community is where we all come together, we get to keep who we are intact. Mm -hmm. there, may be, there may be a thread of commonality through us, but we're not little clones of each other. We're not necessarily in like, you know, wearing all the same color and ascribing to all the same 10 beliefs, but we are diverse, unique people who have found a way and found a common thread with which to exist through. And I think this, these little pods of protection are gonna be what move us into this new earth that all of the spiritual community is talking about. You know, I think that we have to go through the eye of the storm and look at ourselves in a certain way but really what's been like the lifeblood for me is connections with other people and how we move within the human family and not just our family of origin. And that's been really beautiful to see and witness that there has this been this renaissance of really simple ways that we can look after each other, you know? And it can just be like, I lifted my head up from my phone and I saw that there was a beautiful woman in front of me and I gave her a smile or a man or whatever, you know? I think it's actually... Um, these little simple things that add up that really yes. create a massive shift. This is something I'm loving about being in Miami. Like the neighborhood I moved into feels like a neighborhood. Mm. Like I grew up in on Staten Island, which is a borough of New York City for anyone that's not familiar with Staten Island. And you, you knew your neighbors, yeah. you know, you, we, we talked to other people, like we brought food over or whatever you invited people or like there was my bus stop was at the end of the street and we we knew practically everyone along the street it was one block but you knew practically every single person exactly like, so if you street. like if you were going to get in trouble some like some someone's moms another mom could see you and go back and tell your mom so your mom didn't even have to be hyper vigilant they could be like I saw your daughter with you yeah. know, whatever, like and that's, that's annoying, but it's also family, right? <laughs> this isn't funny. So we had a skylight window on my house when I was little and my brother and I loved throwing shit out this window, <laughs> but it was on like the roof, you know? So like our neighbor across the street I, to this day, I don't even know what his real name was. His nickname was buddy. We always called him buddy. And they were much older. They were like old enough to be our grandparents. And, you know, and my mom comes upstairs. She's like, what are you guys doing? We're like, how did you know? She's like, buddy came and told me because he saw you guys. He didn't want you to fall out the window. Exactly. So exactly. like, that's it. But like, that's care. That's being yeah. like, and, and that people would care enough to do that. Right. Because that's, that was something that was so alarming to me about living in California. I have to say, um, just even the last place I lived in LA was in Marina Del Rey. And I specifically moved back into an apartment building because I wanted to have like neighbors and, and, and have like a community feel, mm -hmm. but no one taught, like people would go out of their way not to talk to you. Even if you're like standing in the elevator with them, I became like a snake charmer person. I'd be like <laughs> weaving around, like trying to like bend, like make eye contact. Like I'm going to make you look at me, dog. Yeah. Like, even if you don't say anything, but here literally like the minute I moved into this building people were helping with shit, saw me like trying to carry too much, like just participating. I love that. I love which that. to me, even like out by the pool, like the, it's just so unbelievable to me. People don't look at you like you have seven heads here yeah. when you just go to like have a conversation or make a comment or whatever. It's so, it just feels so different. And I, I needed that. I didn't yeah. realize it's so unhealthy not to have that. I think everyone in LA really needs it too. I mean, it makes sense to me, like Hollywood, like everyone's really cool, but I think underneath that actually people really do want to connect. I think it's like very innate in us to want to do that. You know, I really feel like, so another nature example that I've really been digging recently is that, you know, all of the trees appear to be separate, but underneath there's this like mycelium yes. and it carries information. And so if, there's a tree over here that needs something in the community of trees. They speak to each other and they send resources over. That's the same kind of community care that we want to have for each other. Um, there's another example that I was thinking of, but yeah, we're, we're connected, even though we don't think we are oh, heart math. Okay. So for heart math, people who are into it, our heart or our heart energy extends out six, seven feet around us. 
and it gives inform invisible information to people. It can, you know, it can transmit as much as a smile does. There, you know, there can be a person that walks in the room and they have such a warmth about them. And I think this is the thing that, you know, sometimes we ascribe to holy people or people who have really like sat with themselves, but they just feel different. Like when you look in their eyes, there's a different feeling. And as sort of like scorpionic as I am, which means I'm just like, uh, a little bit hesitant about people at first, I really care. And I really think that we need each other. And that's the thing that we've forgotten is that we're all connected beyond religious affiliations, whether we've done the thing or not done the thing, the color of our skin, our pronouns, all of the identities that we have that are fun to play with. I mean, look at me, like I look like a different person all the time, You're like, you know, but like, take away all this stuff. And I still have an idea about who I am as a, as a soul, as an essence. And I think that that's really important. Yeah, I'm with you. Quick break in the show, everybody, to let you know the applications are open for my 2022 Embodiment Specialist Training. I am so excited about this training. It is like seven or eight years in the making. It is expanded beyond what was Wild Soul Movement teacher training since 2016. And this is really for anybody who feels the pull to graduate from doing basic level self-help, personal development, and spiritual work, and truly embody self-love, healing, and wholeness so they can live soulful and soul-centered lives that contribute to collective healing and liberation, as well as people who are wanting to really integrate the light and the dark, who place a high value on kindness, generosity, integrity, humility, and reverence, who know that while we receive all kinds of gifts and talents and genius, we are the instruments, not the players. This is for people who want to prioritize embodying their divine nature in order to serve the human experience, as well for those who would like to incorporate embodiment work into their professional lives in some way, shape, or form, or just deepen their own practice. So if you want to learn more about the training, which starts in February, 2022, head to untameyourself.com forward slash specialist. Um, there are some dates by which to apply. If you need an extended payment plans, we have a couple different extended payment plans and it's just going to be an incredible alchemical transformative experience. It's going to be a small intimate group because I will also be mentoring and working with everyone one-on-one. -on -one throughout the 13 months of the training. So again, really deep, really beautiful, really incredible experience. If you are interested, go to untameyourself.com forward slash specialist. And I will be so excited to receive your application if you decide to submit one. Um, I love heart math. My project manager, Stephanie, is also super into all that stuff. And she teaches heart math workshops inside nice. the Embodied Living Center. Cause I've just heard, I've never taken like a super deep dive into it, but I'm into this. This is why I love Care Bear Stairs so much. Yeah. 100%. To me, that's like heart math in action. We're like, great, let's blast people with love. I, I used to travel so much in pre-COVID times and I would often really utilize this in airports uh -huh. cause people are so stressed. Some people are so miserable, so rude in airports. And I'd be like, I'm just going to blast these people with some love and see if I could get this line to like, I like it. Function like better. loosen up. That's like, yeah. see, I, I love experiments like that. And that's really like, I'm taking this thing out. That's really how I've decided to live my life is very experimental. When I get really serious, I take a step back and I'm like, Oh, what, how does my life change? If I do this thing, like people have, they send me these questions and they're so serious. And I'm like, okay, yes. Yeah, sometimes it really does feel like that. But what if we had this Mm -hmm. very light approach with how we do that. We're standing in a line and just let's like, what if I just like send out love or what if I just like smile at someone? Does this loosen up the energy of the line? Can I see this energy like snaking through people? You'd be surprised. I mean, everywhere we go, either people think they're like really powerless in a time like this and they don't know what to say or do, or we've realized that these little simple actions and experiments can really like plant a seed and the effect is, is bigger than we think. You know, one of my other favorite ways to do that, um, when I'm in public, if I'm listening to something and something makes me laugh, I don't even try to like I chuckle to myself. I do like a full out, 
the laugh that people know me for yeah. by myself with my headphones. And That's I- like your superpower, by the way. <laughs> it's so infectious and it's so freaking real. And we need to laugh more too. We need to laugh more. So yeah. I just do that wherever I like coffee shops are my favorite. I'll erupt a whole and it's like everyone is turns. But then, like you said, it's, it's contagious. They can't yeah. help themselves. And I'm like, you don't even know what I'm laughing at. But also that so many people would suppress their like they'd probably like cover their mouth or look down or like try not to bother others and I just erupt that's another one of my favorite ways to like just sprinkle a little bit of joy in the world if I can yeah my favorite people are children and whores and children always laugh and dogs and dogs (laughs) and like children they always laugh and whores don't give a what and you know dogs are just honest I just like honest interactions and people more than anything you know all of this like oh it's gotten to a point we just have to break through that and find ourselves and be real and yeah yeah Yeah. and I think like to go back to the thing you said about LA it's it's such a it's more diverse now like industry like many different more industry many whatever that sentence was I think you all know what I mean there's more industries in LA now than just entertainment but there's still that like overarching like veneer about it and of course this is I think of everything in a bell curve the majority of the energy in LA is this way of course there's anomalies and outliers but it's almost like people feel like they have to be a certain way or carry themselves like so and and they can't care too much um there's a woman Oh man, she her name on Instagram is Rainbow Salt. I think yeah. I sent you one of her things the mm-hmm. other day. I love her stuff because her stuff is basically always like slam your heart into everything. Yeah. <laughs> just I love do that. it. I, just yeah. love, just whatever. And I'm like, yes, this is me. I've had my heart broken so much because I refuse to not love. Yeah, same. I, same. I could protect the shit out of myself, but 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 then I also miss out on these incredible, tender, unbelievable experiences that change me all the time. Mm, yeah. Same. <laughs> you're like, add. you're like, add. it's perfect. I, I shared that. And I've always been a get back on the horse type of person. I've just mm-hmm. never understood. I mean, obviously take your time, heal your heart, you know, don't bam, bam, bam. But you know, I always, I'm always going to be a lover. I'm always going to endeavor to open again. I'm always going to try again. And I think it's just the human spirit. You know, I think that's actually pretty innate to us. If we don't, if we don't numb out too much. Yeah. Or tell ourselves stories. I will say in 2021, one of the things that I really put under a magnifying glass was like the stories, the narratives, that I had been hooked into because I started to watch other people get really hooked into very dangerous things and be like, how, but then also look at former me and be like, when have I gotten hooked into very extreme things? When have I gone probably like too far and been quite divisive myself or not as open to being like, well, I might not be into this person's politics, but what else is going on there? Like what might, like, I just refuse to like, throw people all the way out with their identity that I had maybe thought I was or wasn't supposed to be on board. Even me not like I live in Miami, who would have ever thought I'd be glad to be living in a Republican state (laughs) like this governor? No. Do I support all his politics? No. Am I much happier that I live in the state of Florida than the state of California right now? A thousand percent. Exactly. That's why we have to, that's here's a, here's a note from spirit. Sometimes we ask for something and then it trickles down to us and we say, no, not like that. It can't look like that, you know, no. Mm -hmm. And so I think we, it's just another way that we miss out on the many blessings that we have by being so overly identified with the way that we think it's going to come in or our identity or our pronoun or our race or religion. We just get really like brittle and tight and inflexible. (sighs) And I don't think that that is ultimately a part of our innate design we're meant to like I just think of bamboo something that's like what how did my friend put it strong opinions loosely held like that's Mm -hmm. that's the thing Mm -hmm. just stay more open than closed let new information come in let yourself be changed science is always changing there's so many things that we didn't think were possible that are now and so I like to think okay 
Am I on the leading edge of thought? It's important to me. I like it. I like to be up there knowing what's new and what's coming down and what new sort of like spiritual technology we're going to accept. And even just thinking about that when we, people used to run, they were like, oh, you can't do a mile in this amount of time. It's impossible. How many, how many things are we sleeping on right now that are like the whatever minute mile? Do you know what I mean? And the idea is that we keep ushering in something new. And so the only way to do that is to keep your mind and your heart and your body open. Yeah. I was listening to, um, the Carolyn Mason I'm listening to right now is called the power of holy language to change your life. I think to change or transform your life. And this morning, I love Carolyn Mace because she doesn't care. She's yeah. practically yelling at you the whole audio. That's why I like to listen to her because I'm like, I need, no one talks to me like that. Yeah. Please someone yell at me and yell at me about <laughs> spiritual things, right? I don't go to church. So, and I don't like the way that the things that they yell about. So <laughs> she's like, pray like you have a backbone, yeah. not a wishbone. She's yes. like, God is not, a vending machine. Yeah. Stop acting. Stop praying without bring your faith when you pray. You Thank know? You. She's Thank like, you. act like she's basically like act like you know. <laughs> you know, that's the tough love I love. I mean, I I love the really like fierce goddesses, like Dorga, people that just come in and tear it down, you know, yes. because that that is an aspect of the feminine, that is an aspect of the mother. And then afterwards, you know, this gentle energy comes in, scoops Mm -hmm. you back up, make sure, make sure that you're okay. But I really, I need to be talked like that too. And I feel like, um, I like, I like my truth. I like it to sting. I want to know. Yeah. I want to know. I want to know. Cause she goes off too about all these people who will, God won't let that happen. She's like, says who? Yeah. Yeah. She's like, says who? She's like, you're talking about a race of people that creates weapons to blow the other half of the people up. Yeah. She's like, of course it would happen. Yeah, yeah. Like God can't do anything about the choices all these people are making. Preach. My God. Preach. (laughs) So, Well, something you said, um, I think when you said your message from spirit made me think of that, but there was was something else that was relevant to what you had just said. Um, She just is so adamant that people really bring their faith and their trust to everything. Yeah. And I'm hearing that it's it's not even necessarily something you've said, but it's in everything you've said. Mm. Right? Because how like even the beginning when you said like I actually hate uncertainty even though Scorpios are supposed to love the mystery, but the fact that you just like play with it, ride with it, go with it, deal with it there has to be so much faith and trust in that. So I'm curious for you, how do you cultivate your faith and trust? And when it gets challenged, when it gets dinged, you know, like sometimes when things don't go our way or whatever, we're like, damn, what am I even doing? Is any of this shit real? Like, do you even have those moments anymore? Of course. Of course. One thing that I was thinking of as we were talking about this is I'm doing a lot of work around grief and grief can feel like just a sudden wave that comes and sweeps your feet out. And honestly, that's the way it's supposed to feel. It's supposed to bring us to our knees. And someone whose message I love is this man named Martin Preetel. And he's kind of this like big storyteller. He's got like a gravelly he's got a gravelly voice and he's like, when you grieve, you should look like you've grieved, you know, like not, none of these little tears, like you, your feet really need to hit the ground because grief is actually praise for life. It's praise for what we've loved. And I think the reason that I can be such a big lover is because grief has overtaken me, you know, and I've really allowed it. The last seven years have been a lot of massive changes, deaths, rebirths, all kinds of things. And I think for me, when I start to believe that I have to do it on my own, it gets really hard. It feels like I'm pushing a boulder up a hill. And for a while, you just do that. Sometimes you really do take the hard road. And then something in me shifts. I hear something. I remember like, oh my God, I'm, I'm not telling my heart to beat right now. Um, I'm actually breathing. Like there's so many things that are going on that are in union with something that's bigger than me. Oh, step back. I have a little post-it note that says before it manifests, where is it? And as a person who is kind of obsessed with the metaphysical and mysteries and the dream time and things that aren't quite solid yet, like actually that's where I thrive, you know, to the getting to the point before it's solid, before it manifests. And so 
I think it's just a mindset shift for me. And sometimes that you are, you just, you work really hard and you think you're doing it all on your own. And you know, it's, uh, you dig in and then you like, you surrender and you remember that there is a current that's taking you. There is a power that's outside of yourself. That's also within yourself. And even if it's just like connecting back to the fact that you're breathing and there's so much about how the human body works, that's a giant mystery. And for me, I have faith and trust in the other portion of it. And that's, you know, that's ultimately this, that process of forgetting and remembering, it's like rebirthing yourself into an elder, a person that that's not just age, but that holds the wisdom of the years that they've, and millennia. I know you work in the Akashic. I feel like I've worked within the Akashic because sometimes I'll have a word come in. I'll be like, in this like poetic thing and this perfect word will come in and I look it up and I'm like, that's exactly the word that I wanted. Wasn't quite sure that it meant that thing. And I just love it when spirit, whatever it is, just, totally. drop, just drops it yeah. in. Yeah. So, You're like, how did I know that? It's like, exactly, gotcha. exactly. And I'm like, oh, thanks. Yeah. Like just a clear channel, you know? I want to tell you two things. <laughs> this, so synchronicity is one of my favorite forms mm. of you know, I'm not super into Danielle Laporte anymore, but I remember one of her truth bombs back in the day was like, synchronicity is the universe's way of saying yes. Yeah. It was like, yeah, like literally, yes. And I've been really, again, because Carolyn Mace, but back in March, I'd ordered like the complete works of St. Teresa of Avila, like volume one, because, yeah. you know, being raised Catholic, I just resonate a lot with things that stem from Catholics because I get their context, you know, it's same characters. I get it, you know, like different look, same Jesus, different (laughs) context, you know? So, um, but I, I never even opened the book. Then when I start listening to Carolyn Mace's entering the castle, it's literally, it's St. Teresa of Avila's work. And then, um, the other day, so I pulled that book back off the shelf that I had ordered back in March and never opened. And it's, it was sitting here on my dining room table. And I started taking Spanish lessons. I have a tutor once a week and we meet and we talk. And the way she teaches, it's really cool. It's, it's actually quite embodied. That's how I originally found her is she, um, she'll she pull pieces of text, like things that you would be interested in anyway. I love that. But you could be learning the language through things that have meaning for you anyway, because the idea being if something has meaning for you, you're more likely to remember it. You're more likely to be into it, relate to it, whatever. Um, and, it, and it could become more embodied. And so I opened the document. She had pulled like two passages. And w- the first thing was like an excerpt from a freaking poem from St. Teresa of Avila. Yes. And I had made a post on Instagram about it that, that morning. And I just started sobbing. I was like, did you do this on purpose? She was like, no. And that's, I was like, St. Teresa's coming for me right now. Yes, she is. Um, Do you know this word chiromancy? No. So, okay, you'll be into it. It's, it's, it's how you woo synchronicity. It's, it's. How do you spell it? K-A-I-R-O. Mancy, which is a form of Oracle divination. And my, my favorite person who, um, talks a lot about this is an, an older gentleman storyteller named Robert Moss. He, mm-hmm. he teaches dream work, but he talks about chiromancy. And this was a, this was like a big part of my last year. It's like, okay, if synchronicity is a force and we understand that it's at play and it's working, how can I, how can I be a part of it? How can I play with it? And sometimes it's just like, it's random. It shows its head or whatever. But when you have an intention to be a chiromancer, then life takes on this very mystical, magical quality. And it's, yes. it's one of my favorite, it's one of my favorite things to play with. I love this. The other thing I wanted to tell you was, um, I think I had told you about this man earlier this year. I met this man. He ended up being my realtor, although I had met him on a dating app and he like, he helped me find this apartment. We cut, we went on some dates. Like there was definitely, there was a vibe. I wasn't sure where it was going to go, but I had been so isolated in the pandemic. There were just like all these things and all these synchronicities and like these things we had in common. And like the connection was very intense. And, um, but he looked like Jesus. He looked like Cuban Dominican Jesus. And so um, ultimately he ended up being unavailable, unavailable in a way that I previously was not attuned to perceiving. And so since Um, that experience. And, you know, I had to have a conversation with them, like shortly after I got here to be like, all right, like, is this going to go anywhere? Is it not going to go anywhere? Like, what do we think? And he didn't really want to pick a lane. And I was like, all right, cool. Let's be friends then. Because I don't, 
I don't do the wishy-washy thing. Um, And I was just reflecting this morning on, this is how infinite intelligence works Mm -hmm. because I really do. I have such a Mary Magdalene thing and I love Jesus so much. I was just imagining, like, I call it my divine support squad being like, okay, how are we going to get this final message through to her? How are we going to help her see this? And they were like, got it. Make him look like Jesus. Yeah. You know, my guys, you know tell- we're going to have to send in a Jesus look like she'll 100%. really pay attention. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> your, your, your spirit team knows exactly what will get you to move. <laughs> what, will, what will help you. And often it is for me, it is, you know, love related, passion related. Yeah. It's like, it gets my attention every time. And it gets into those places where I can easily throw up a hand with other things. So I get it. I get it. Cause it was funny. And here's why I'm sharing this and I'm sharing it with you and I'm sharing it with people who are into this episode because I had a moment actually, it was on our second date where it felt like time stopped. He said something that was so spiritually meaningful for me has been for many, many years. And it literally felt like the temperature in the room changed. Yeah. Time slowed down. There was more space between the molecules and the air. Like everything it got thick I was it was so crazy it was almost like in a movie when like like time stops and only one or two people are aware that it happened and he looked at me he was like what he's like why am I tearing up and it was it was a whole moment and for me I just didn't have the ability in that moment to be like this could be non-romantic of course I was like this is a soulmate this is my husband like Venus and Leo it's 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 a rough life but um (laughs) Now in retrospect, I'm like, oh my God, no, but he did actually really come to prepare me for a bigger, greater love by revealing something that I hadn't dealt with and something that I wasn't looking at and being exactly how he would, like, I've gone into my records about this. I'm like, oh, I got it. Like there was a contract, not the contract I wanted. Yeah. Yeah. You know, when we're in right relationship with love, I feel like, you know, And whether we get there in this lifetime or not, it doesn't matter. But to me, we've taken on this contractual thing with love. It gets so weird. We'll meet friends that we've known for two seconds. Oh my God, I love her. We're already using the word about this this connection that we feel. But when it comes to anything romantic, we start to act really weird. Like, okay, this is what this means if I do this. And I'm like, I'm a fucking lover. It's what I do. If this scares you back away because it is what I do, but it doesn't, you know, it's not a contractually binding thing, Yeah, you know, and in the past, I probably would have believed that it is, but I've just really realized that we've got a weird relationship with love and contracts. And, you know, we use the word a lot and, but what does it really mean? What does it mean to say, I love you? Does it, what, you know, what this is what I mean? like about learning another language. There's so many terms of endearment in Spanish. Yes. There's so many different ways to say love. And okay, that, try, try some on me. <laughs> Come on. There are, well, amor, which is love, right? But then there's words like cariño, querida. Um, they're slipping out of my mind because it was on the spot. But there's just things that you just know. Um, or you say to someone like, hey, adoro, like, I adore you. Yeah. You know, and I've taken that. Like, I've started to try to use different words to describe, oh, I adore him. I adore her. Like, how can we describe? Because that love, and then that word gets like um, sanitized or, you know, and it feels like it doesn't mean anything, but it means a million things. I like that. Mm -hmm. There's a word, my abuelita, since I was tiny, has been calling me um, negrita de mi corazón. And that term which now, if, if you hear anything like with those letters, you're like, oh shit, is that racist? Like, are you not supposed to say that? And I'm sure some people would argue one thing or another. I actually met neighbors who have a black dog and it's named Negrita. Yeah. And, but again, it's that term of endearment from certain cultures. And they, I was like, oh, what's the dog's name? And they kind of like winced to tell me because it was like, they probably named their dog long before it's an old dog. We were in this like <laughs> Uber PC time, exactly. you know? Um, and again, like different people might have different uh, levels of tolerance for times changing or not or whatever. But I remember being a little kid and being like, is she calling me a little black girl? Should she say that? Is that okay? Yeah. But that's not, that's not what it meant. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. We have a narrow context of, and also we think 
we're the only ones. And there's a lot of other people. That's why like throw out your dream dictionary, throw out any one size fits all thing. It just isn't a thing, you know? And obviously you can choose if you're gonna become offended by something or you can stay open and be curious about what it means in someone mm -hmm. else's culture. And that, that works a lot better for me is like intent versus like, you know, how we may, how, how we may have been indoctrinated. Like that's a word that's coming up for people a lot because we have been so indoctrinated and it's like finding yourself within that, you know, it's a really yeah. important time to really find yourself in that. Yeah. And you mentioned intent and, you know, there's this popular saying, and we talked, we've talked about it a lot on the podcast, the relationship between intent and impact. And there are some people who want to be like, intent doesn't matter. It's all about impact. And it's like, no, of course, intent always matters. Yeah, It has to matter. And then we need to also understand the impact, but we need to understand that the impact is going to be different on different people for different reasons. Exactly. How in the world could I ever create a sentence that's going to impact every person the same way? I literally would not have anything to say. And so I've <laughs> long just been like, you know what, claim claim your trigger. It is literally a point yeah. of power that you can reclaim. And if I'm standing in front of you, that's why I put, you know, as Scorpio seasons ramped up. And just as I've like gotten to this, my mom was always naked. This is going to be about being naked and about being com comfortable in your body. So I've just gotten to a point where I was like, man, I spent so many years self-loathing and, and have, and, and literally not having the ability to see how, what a great form I was in until many years removed. So I'm like, all right, I'm obviously projecting on myself right now. I'm not seeing my true beauty. I'm going to actually just act like, I'm just going to feel like I would looking back and I'm going to do that. And so I've been just sharing a lot of things that are saucy and I love it. And I put something up that was like, you know, my sensuality is here as a mirror for you because I know what my intent is and it's pure actually. It's just a pure exploration of who I am as a sensual woman. And whatever you place on that, so you could see it, it could bring up feelings within you. Those are yours. Like, I'm just a mirror. You own it. You know, whatever you're feeling, it's yours. And so I've really tried to live my life in that same. I just don't shoot the messenger. Sometimes I'll share something from someone and I'll be like, do you know that this person is horrible? I can't believe you've done that. And I'm like, well, then, then who do we talk to? We're all flawed. Either we're all fucking okay. I used to do that shit for sure. I used to really police the source of fucking everything. I might, I think you commented on it. I made a post about this a couple of weeks ago. I'm like, listen, y'all, I'm sorry that I didn't trust you all to figure out if someone was a piece of shit or not, basically. Yeah. Like, yeah. I'm sorry for all the times that I thought I needed what? to like so deeply vet everything. And people that are pieces of shit can teach you something and they can say listen. something that's fundamentally true, whether they live it or not. Yes. Whether they fall short of the glory of God, we all have. Yeah. But there's been a lot of people who have said really important things that can change your life. And if we shoot the messenger, then our worlds become really, really small, yeah. become really, really brittle. It's just, I don't think the creator just, no, it's a yeah. no people. <laughs> Someone was up in my DMs, like, I don't know, just because I'm not vaccinated. Um, people or some people want to call me like anti-vax. I'm like, I'm really not like, I don't care what other people do. I, I believe in other vaccines. Like this COVID one is kind of shady. There, yeah. There's like more yeah. and more stuff coming out. That's really making me really glad that I've made the choice I've made, but I'm not going to be grudge anyone there or the thing. And I'm not out here trying to convince people not to get it. Like, that's just yeah. not my way, not my jam. And this woman was like, then maybe you want to stop sharing things from other anti-vaxxers. And I'm like, I didn't even know. Like, and I can't, and I realized I like literally how exhausting that was for all the years that I did that, yeah. like v overly vetting and whatever, and like all this stuff. And cause we just don't know, we don't know. And we don't know who someone's going to be like next week. And I can't like, I've deleted a whole bunch of podcasts, a podcast from people who came out and turned out to be like really shitty. And that feels good to me in retrospect to be like, because I don't, I don't want people to like go. If I know I'm not gonna be like, yeah, listen. And I'm not going to like edit the show to be like, Hey, by the way, like even earlier when I was like, yeah, I'm not super into Danielle Laporte anymore, but you know, if you love Danielle Laporte, you love Danielle Laporte. Do you think? But I just say those things. I like make my little asterisk notes. There's no perfect way, but I'm with you. I stopped yeah. shooting messengers this year. Good. I think, uh, anti carries the seed of the thing that you are against. Mm -hmm. So even before this, it never really worked for me. It's like, as I've learned certain spiritual principles, it really had, and like, for better, or for worse, 
Kanye West has made an impression on this human mm -hmm. because of his, like, I saw this clip of him where he, like, he's like, I no longer use the word try. It's either you do or you don't. I'm not going to try to pick up the pencil. I mean, unless you're, there's mobility issues, whatever, you get it. But there's a lot of words like that, that I really don't work for me anymore. Mm -hmm. And anti is one of them. And it's also just a clever marketing. It's just when it, I know where a person's at based on what they're coming at me with, whether it's yeah. well thought out, I will entertain all creative inquiries. But if you just come up with just, if you're just spewing the rhetoric that they're telling you to spew, I just can't. It's like, we can't even have a conversation anymore because you've reduced me to an idea. I'm not a human. I haven't had a story. There's not anything I can say to you. And so people, when, when people come at me with anti, there's two things I think. And it's like, I'm too smart to be anti anything. I'm going to be pro whatever I'm for. Mm -hmm. And secondly, um, yeah. W where did this clever label that we can just slap on everything come from, you know? Yeah, that that this year, more than any other year of my own life, personally, I've just seen how dangerous that is and how people really devolve, it seems, around that. Like there's been a lot of really surprising people in my life who have been shocked to see how they have behaved, how they've treated me, how they've responded to certain things. Yeah. Like people who really know me without even like having a conversation with me yeah. about something. And I'm like, for real, like you're not even gonna ask. Like you yeah. just going to decide. So interesting, but you know, that, I think that's also, that's also God. That's also divine orchestration being like, Hey, you thought this person probably needed to be in your life or it'd be closer. And guess what? We're going to just move them away. Cause it's not super aligned. Yeah. Anymore. Yeah. I've experienced that. That's hurtful when it's like, Oh my God, I sat on your couch. Like, yeah. you know, my dad's name, come yeah. on, <laughs> let's have a conversation. Yeah, totally. <laughs> fascinating um anything I haven't asked you yet that you're like I, I want to talk about that or is there any loops we leave anything open that you feel like you want to close I, don't, I can't think of anything I don't think this is a great I love a great winding conversation I was writing things down let me just make sure I asked you um everything that I was writing down as you were saying it oh oh okay yeah let's end on this all right new earth this is one of these things that I'm like ah, I don't love the way some people use it Cause I feel like some people are just using this concept to create more like spiritual superiority and like condescension. And it just is more separation too, but I get it. Like we need new shit. Like this is not working yeah. <laughs> or rather, I think you kind of alluded to this earlier. It's working exactly the way it was designed to, but this is not what a lot of us want. Yeah. This is not going to get us. A lot of it is not going to get us to the place where we really want to go or where we really could go. So when you say new earth, what does that mean to you? maybe it's like the, the new ancient, it's like actually remembering, um, you know, what does it mean? I think it's way simpler. And I think that it has become, and it's funny. Cause I did like, when all this started, I did a, um, an online like a symposium and it was called the new earth symposium. And, um, it was just a bunch of people who were creatively thinking about what can bridge us in between, the old way of doing things. And there was a lot of things that I subscribed to. I'm like, oh, this is completely normal. And then when I thought about it, I'm like, this is not life-giving. Actually, when yes. I think about what I need to be a sovereign, upright, creative, you know, connected individual, a lot of the things had to be stripped away. And I've been in this process for a while because I've always just mm -hmm. been kind of a different thinker. Like I would hold back. I wasn't bandwagony. There were things that I loved, but I love to dip my toe in all of them. And like, you know, I used to be so into Abraham and it's not my favorite thing anymore, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's just, it's a part of the evolution. But anyway, for me, it means it's, it's, it's way more simple than this big term that we see on a lot of, I don't know, spiritual accounts, the new earth, the new earth, like some, I think, I don't know. There's so many beliefs around it. For me, it's actually really simple. It's about infusing my life with the things that make me, um, healthy, happy, and whole. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of the old systems don't work and that we need smaller, um, smaller little pods of care. And so for me, it's been putting my energy into communities that, that um, uh, run a broad swath. It's not just like, okay, I'm only speaking to people who think like me, look like me and move like me. Mm -hmm. It's like, no, I'm giving, I'm giving my 
my life force to the continuation of the species in all these little ways. So the new earth for me is these really simple things that we can do to remember each other within this structure that is really considering so few people. And the so few people that are being considered are jaunting off to space and creating more tech and just a bunch of stuff that keeps us distracted, sick, unhealthy, not connected. It, it seems like it's good, but then the payoff at the end is not. And so to me, the new earth is simple. It's really simple. Yeah, I love that. Um, yeah, you had some stories recently. It might've even been like yesterday about this whole like Facebook meta, the AI. I've always been so resistant to AI because I'm like, but why, why don't we just want to be in our lives? Yeah. Why do we want to have that thing? And I tried one once, well, the, the VR thing. Mm-hmm. Have you ever put one of those headsets on? Yeah. I was just like, dude, I'm a lucid dreamer. Like, let's just remember that all the technology <laughs> that they are selling us back is already innate within us. And I get that it takes a practice and most people want to pop a pill, put a VR thing on, but it's not, it's, um, it's backwards to me. It's upside down. So I did, it was weird, very disorienting. And then I realized that I've always been a lucid dreamer and it's way cool to populate my dream in that way than to get sold an expensive headset by some white dude that's real that's well off fuck you I don't need it (laughs) you're like that's not for me yeah Yeah, it's very it's very disorienting and to me it always just struck me as escapist that was one of the biggest things when I look at my time in California I'm like I had to really experience and even get hooked in some ways by the underbellies of two things which was new age spirituality Mm -hmm. and like super like neo liberalism, especially like white liberalism. And I was like, wow, neither of those things are for me, Mm -hmm. but thank you for the time that I got like hooked into it, felt how I felt under the spell. And I was like, Ooh, no, that's, there are certain, like in all things, there are certain things that's like, okay, this, 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 some seeds that are interesting and probably important, but so many things that are like, Ooh, you go too far into that. We lose ourselves and we lose each other. Yeah. That's yeah. And that's, what AI is and the fact that they've used meta. I'm like, how dare them take that term, you know, metaphysical, like the meta. And I'm like, what? No, 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 no. That's when I quit Facebook uh, when that happened. I mean, I really wasn't on it anyway, but I just was like, you made it really simple for me, Mark Zuckerberg. And I'm out. We're just going to pretend not to know that Facebook owns Instagram. It's fine. Exactly, exactly. (laughs) We have to pick our battles. There's just right. so many to have. Blind, blind eye right now. Oh my that. God. So, okay. Where people find you on Instagram, it's your name, yeah. Asia Ophelia. And we'll put links to everything in the show notes. Um, is that your website as well? Yeah. All Great. roads lead home. And if you've known me by the Girlfriend Manifesto, it'll still lead you back to the portal. Asia okay, Ophelia. Great. When did you change that? I think last year I just took the title of the girlfriend manifesto off and just went by my first name. I had this weird card reading from this woman and it was like, it was very strange, but the the nugget I got at the very end was like, yeah, I'm going to do that. Actually, that makes sense. And I was like, if my name's available, I'll do it. And it was just a simple change. And it felt, it felt really good. It's such a beautiful name. Like it's the energy of it, like you said, the energy, the name had such an impact on you, but even seeing it, it's, yeah, there's kind a of, real energy to that name. I like hearing it too. I'm just kind of, I'm obsessed with it. I'm like, oh, that's me. Someone just said my name. I like yeah, it. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> well, thank you so much. I'm so glad we finally got to do this probably thank years you. in the making. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for having me. All right, everyone share it up. Follow Asia. This is a great episode, by the way. I like to remind people sometimes, listen to this more than once. There were so many nuggets and we pulled so many threads. This will be a good one to listen to a couple of different times and also use it as like a book club. Like have a fun conversation with some friends about this episode. Pick things apart. Be like, what would we think? Even if you were like, I vehemently disagree with that thing. Great. Use the episode for that and get clear on your own beliefs. Mm -hmm. Um, All right, everybody. I guess I'll stop talking now. Talk to you later.